Hi, Scott. Welcome to uh, 2024 and the beginning of our second season. Hey, Mark, it's hard to believe, uh, but I'm really looking forward to this year. You know, there's a lot going on again with drug pricing and the challenges around patient access. Uh, plus, it's an election year. And uh, so drug costs and patient access both, we think, will be a campaign topic. Oh, no doubt. And there's nobody better to help us uh, look ahead to 2024 than our guest today. It's Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark McClellan. And uh, bear with me. Mark is the Director and Professor of Business, Medicine, and Policy at the Duke Margulis Center for Health Policy at Duke. For six years, he served as, uh, in the George W. Bush administration as Commissioner of the FDA and then as Administrator of CMS. He's also an independent board member of Johnson & Johnson and Sigma, Cigna. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be with you and uh, great to be kicking off 2024. I agree with you. This is going to be a big year for both innovation in drugs and for finding better ways to assure access and sustainable affordability. Yep. Well, that's our mission here. And we're, uh, as, as Mark says, we're, we're really pleased to have you. Thanks for joining us. And so just to dive right in, you know, to begin with, uh, the government obviously has a multiple of roles around healthcare. Uh, pricing and reimbursement and access generally, and including obviously particularly drugs. Um, and let's talk a little bit first, uh, uh, thinking about government as a purchaser of healthcare and of drugs, whether that's through Medicaid or Medicare or any of the other various programs. Uh, from that lens, Mark, what are the major 24 topics uh, we and our listeners should be thinking about and preparing for? Well, there's, there's a lot going on there, obviously, and I don't think your listeners have been under a rock, so they know that 2024 is the big first year implementation of price negotiation under the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's 10 drugs this time around. It's a uh, program's going to expand. This is a program that was implemented very quickly, not the usual approach in Congress of, uh, like when we set up Medicare Part D to begin with, we had what seemed like almost no time, but two years to go from legislation to implementation, which was enough time to do what's called notice and comment rulemaking, which is a you know public, transparent process intended to share all the details of how a program is going to be implemented and get comment on them before you actually do it. For the Inflation Reduction Act price negotiation, they're wanting time to do it. So that's going to kick in in 2026, but the negotiation for the first set of drugs actually started in 2024. So this is more you know, building the, the plane as you're actually implementing it. People are gonna find out what's in negotiation as these negotiation processes for actual drugs move forward. So there are a lot of questions about that that are going to get clarified over the course of the year. Uh, also, uh, in terms of government purchasing, people need to remember that probably the biggest thing that Medicare beneficiaries are gonna notice about the IRA is the biggest expansion of Medicare Part D since the program was created. That's why I went to yeah. CMS, as you mentioned, back in the uh, in the, the George W. Bush administration. I was really enjoying uh, life at FDA. It's a great place to, to work uh, around medical, biomedical innovations or everything that manage, matters to people in terms of health. Um, but this is the biggest change in Part D since it was created. It's uh, now gonna have a uh, so-called catastrophic uh, protection and by 2025, even before negotiation kicks in, it's going to lead to a big change in the way that PBMs and the, the, the Medicare Advantage plans that they work with are accountable for the, the cost of these uh, specialty drugs that are now the main area of action in spending and, and innovation for, for drugs. So that's uh, going to get set up and going in 2025. Um, and just, you know, not that that isn't enough, but uh, Congress is in the process of considering some bipartisan legislation that would change the way that PBMs work, particularly uh, limiting some of the things that they do in Medicaid and, uh, and Medicare and creating more transparency with the employers or the mm -hmm. health plans that are working with the PBMs as part of, uh, I think, a push towards more transparency generally in, in, in drug pricing and, and some continued efforts to try to pass along the savings from drug price negotiation to uh, the actual beneficiaries who are using those drugs. Um, so things to watch there too. And on the Medicaid side, um, 
some big opportunities, but some concerns driven by biomedical innovation. We saw the first two gene therapies for sickle cell disease approved at the end of 2024. Gene therapies really seem to be starting to take off in terms of actually demonstrating enough safety and effectiveness to get through FDA. We have definitely not solved the problems. Well, how do we pay for these treatments, especially in Medicaid, which is disproportionately covering uh, the kids and uh, the individuals affected by conditions like sickle cell. So it's going to be a busy year, um, but one where you know, these are tough problems to have innovation on the one side, uh, affordability and access on the other. But, you know, I'd rather have those problems than, than not. We just have to figure out better solutions. Yeah, if I could just follow on a, a couple of things. There are some more recent late breakers, you know, um, at least being discussed that you didn't mention. One, um, the discussion around marching rights uh, for the government. Yep. And also, secondly, the um, state of Florida and, and reimportation from Canada. Yeah, maybe Florida first. So uh, um, Rob Califf is the first FDA commissioner to find that drug importation could be done safely and reliably. And if you look closely at what was approved in Florida, there are a lot of steps that the state said that they're going to take in terms of inspections and tracking the whole supply chain for drugs that are imported. And along with that, not surprisingly, the state said that it's only aiming, at least initially, to use importation in a narrow set of drug products, ones essentially for people who are funded through programs like um, Ryan White or other federal initiatives designed for people who don't have insurance that do have serious problems. Maybe they'll expand it to Medicaid, they said. Uh, it's not clear to me, um, Scott and Mark, from looking at the details here, whether and how much savings are actually going to be realized right. through that mechanism, if they actually follow all the steps uh, that are there. But it's certainly not going to be a big enough program to have a material impact on affordability and, and scale of access and, and things like that anytime in the foreseeable future. And with Martian rights, you know, this is an area of concern that has been growing. Um, a lot of Democratic Party support for um, trying to connect more the, the early stage federal support for research and development that happens pretty broadly and it's pretty fundamental uh, to the development and, and um, uh, initial uh, testing in humans for, for drugs. There's still a critical partnership there with the private sector to move those products forward and to get all the way through, you know, CMCs and reliable manufacturing and, and availability at scale and so forth. Um, it, it's been an issue in the past. It's getting to be more of a live issue. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that works out, too. It's uh, and, and on top of all that, we should also mention this is a contentious election year and drug pricing and, you know, for the Biden administration demonstrating that some of their policies, especially the IRA, it is having an impact on pricing and access uh, is really important. Uh, on the other side, it's not completely clear who the Republican nominee is going to be yet. But as you all may recall, President Trump and his administration uh, tried to move in the direction of so-called most favored nation uh, pricing for drugs. And you know, the price can't be higher in the U.S. than it is in you know, other uh, uh, developed countries. So these issues are, are going to be uh, live and on the front burner. It's just a reminder that you know, if you don't like those approaches, the alternative isn't staying where we were. That's not that's not what either party right. is talking about. It's finding a way that provides um, more access while still encouraging innovation. And that's that's what I, you know, that's, that was my main point. 2024 is going to be a critical year for figuring out if we can do that. Well, it's incredible. A lot, a lot to keep, you know, keep track of this year. If I yeah. could, um, you mentioned the patient access and affordability uh, uh, benefits of the IRA. Um, but you also mentioned the Part D changes, catastrophic uh, coverage and uh, impact on PBMs and specialty drugs. Can you go just uh, maybe one le level deeper on that in terms of are there patient benefits potentially coming out of that uh, or, or drug affordability improvements for patients? 
Yeah, I think those are actually going to be the things that patients, especially those that have had high out-of-pocket costs because they're using some of these specialty drugs, that still is a lot more people than it used to be. And if you look at Medicare Part D spending growth between the time we implemented the program uh, and now, almost all of that spending growth has been in the so-called catastrophic part of the benefit. When that was set up in, in the Medicare Modernization Act in 2004, remember, um, the biggest areas of drug innovation had been in small molecule drugs, things like statins, other drugs that could make a huge difference for populations, but the cost was in the you know hundreds of dollars per year. So um, the benefit was set up, it had that uh, it had some help up front for almost everybody. It had that famous donut hole and it had catastrophic protection on the back end that at the time was not very expensive because there weren't that many drugs that got to so-called, you know, several thousand dollars or catastrophic levels of, uh, of spending. And that benefit was paid mainly by the federal government. You know, we didn't know at the time whether drug only coverage could actually work in a population like Medicare, where there's so much uh, need for drugs to help manage and prevent, you know, serious complications from chronic conditions that are very predictable. Um, you know, once you know you have the risk factor, and that's, that's become even more so. Over the next 20 years, we've seen, um, you know, biologics that are covered under Part D, you know, like self-injectables, uh, other specialty drugs that have really driven up costs in that part of the benefit. And that's been paid for, you know, mostly the vast majority of costs by the federal government, only a small part by the Part D or Medicare Advantage plans and 5% by Medicare beneficiaries themselves. Well, that's no longer a, a suitable benefit. And we know now that Part D coverage can work both as part of an integrated Medicare Advantage plan and in partnership with um, traditional Medicare coverage as a standalone plan. And what the um, Medicare Modernization Act with respect to Part D did was, even though the IRA itself was a partisan bill, it adopted a very broad-based bipartisan plan, one that we at Duke Margolis helped develop and, and um, refine to modernize this Part D benefit structure. So you might think, well, you know, um, 2% of people now who are using these high cost drugs, that's only a small part of the Medicare program. Um, that's true, but they are gonna get a lot of help and no senior, you know, with the, the new Part D coverage that's kicking in this year, like right now, uh, is gonna have to pay more than $2,000, you know, adjusted for inflation over time out of pocket for their drugs, which is a huge help for people who are using some of these cancer therapies and some of the coming um, therapies uh, related to, you know, diabetes, GLP-1s, et cetera, that, that would put them into, you know, that high drug cost uh, category. So that's gonna make a big difference. Wow. And this is for all drugs, so, so broader than, um, uh, just that the 10 drugs are going to get negotiated and uh, starting in 2026 and uh, and increase out over time. So this is why I think seniors are going to notice the most. If I was running the Biden re-election campaign, this is the thing that I'd um, uh, focus on. But it is going to have some other effects uh, just to go one level further down, which is that because the Part D plan, standalone or Medicare Advantage are now accountable for most of these drug costs in the catastrophic part of the benefits starting in 2025, not this year, next year, um, they're going to be much more concerned than they were in the past about spending uh, in that range. So what's that going to mean? Well, probably more steps to try to discourage people from reaching the catastrophic part of the benefit. Remember, uh, up until now, uh, if you, you know, it, it's true that, that drug plans are on the hook for, for spending but they're only on the hook for spending of a small proportion of drug costs at the high level, much more at the lower level. So, so now I'm going to try to keep people out of that spending level more. And remember that Medicare Modernization Act didn't give drug plans any new tools to use. So what are the tools they have available? Well, they're the traditional ones, uh, utilization review, formulary placement, um, uh, co-pays as long as you're below the, um, the, the catastrophic limit and you're not, you know, 
through high copays, encouraging people to get too fast to the catastrophic limit. So I think that means, you know, I know physicians aren't that uh, much in favor of things like uh, utilization review programs, prior auth, et cetera. I think you're gonna see more of that. And I also think, you know, we've seen this trend in Medicare towards growth in Medicare Advantage, you know, kind of more integrated, comprehensive plans delivered by the private sector. CMS took some steps last year to tamp down on payments in the Medicare Advantage program relative to fee for service. And so some people are projecting, well, you know, Medicare Advantage isn't going to grow as fast as it did. It's still growing. It's more than half of beneficiaries and it's projected to continue to grow. Remember that the Medicare Advantage plans are going to have an easier time coordinating drug spending, especially at the high end, with their network physicians who are doing the prescribing for those drugs in a way that standalone drug plans cannot. And I think what you're going to see as a result of that is less, you know, Medicare Advantage is going to look a bit less like reliance on prior auth utilization review stuff that really is going to make physicians and patients annoyed versus Medicare Advantage plans that are going to try harder to coordinate what they're doing with their PBM on the drug side and what they're doing with their providers to, to really try to get people into value-based payment arrangements. You know, think about how you could use uh, GLP-1s in an integrated Medicare Advantage plan to um, really tamp down other drug costs to prevent complications like hospitalizations that add up on the, the, the Medicare Part A or Part B side, you know, put all that together. That's harder to do in a standalone drug plan. So right now, if you're in Medicare Advantage, you get 10% uh, or more uh, reduction in the Part D premium relative to traditional Medicare, and you get more generous coverage. I think those differences are going to get exaggerated as we head into 2025 and beyond. And this is really going to drive, hopefully, some useful innovation in you know stopping to think about drugs as something that's over here, you know, on one side that PBM should control the costs of and the rest of medical care, um, hospital, physician, et cetera, is over here, but really try to get a more integrated approach to, to those efforts. And it's going to be challenging. People are going to complain about utilization review and so forth with these changes coming in, but I think it creates some more pressure um, to really think about, you know, how do we get total cost of care down and how do we use drugs uh, effectively to get us there? Well, that's why we have our podcast, right? <clears throat> and exactly. Lots to talk about this yeah, year. No doubt. <clears throat> Bear with me. Excuse me. Um, if I could, though, Mark, you, you mentioned some of the great drugs and some of the things that are coming down the pipeline. Another role that the government plays is as a product and technology regulator. Um, and you're one of the few people that have worn many hats. So uh, last year, they, in 2023, they approved uh, 20, let's see, 66 drugs and biologics, which was uh, yeah. uh, a big increase over previous years. What can yeah. we expect from the FDA in 2024? Yeah, it was a pretty remarkable year last year. Remember that um, that big increase to 66 came on the tail end of a year, the year before 2022, where the numbers were actually down significantly. A lot of people have speculated about why that is. The one that reason that seems to make some sense is uh, COVID uh, um, kind of after effects. There were a lot, you know, FDA right. was slowed down in its ability to do inspections, especially around, you know, CMCs, all the, the, the manufacturing reliability for products that needs to be worked out. Uh, before approval, something that doesn't get a lot of attention, but deserves more of more concerns and need for advanced manufacturing. So, you know, I, th I think part of this was a, sort of a spillover effect from low numbers in 2022, but it was an amazing year. And as you said, not just for drugs, but for new kinds of biologics. We've already talked about some of the um, uh, incredibly important gene therapies that, that were approved in 2023. I think where you know, people have been projecting growth in gene therapy approvals now for several years. It's been slow in coming, mainly because of sort of manufacturing and, and reliability um, questions, given the complexity of the therapies. But we're seeming to start to move past that. It was also a good year for, for vaccines, um, RSV vaccines for the, uh, for, for the first time and, and other um, uh, biologics too. So I'm not sure that 2024 is going to quite reach the 
the 66 number, but we are in a, a pretty impressive time of, of opportunity for, for drug innovation and uh, a lot of programs at FDA uh, in terms of accelerated approval, um, uh, um, you know, getting past the COVID delays and in interactions between companies and regulators to, to get to approval. But that goes back to what we were talking about before with more products getting to the market faster, um, those concerns about costs and concerns about access uh, are just going to get more salient as well. Mm -hmm. How, and, and within the operations of the FDA, Mark, are there any you know trends going there that are important in terms of uh, priorities and receptivity to you know, the, the new medicines and the new platforms and all those things? Yeah, I, I'd highlight um, a, a couple of things. First of all, keep in mind that FDA is a hugely important um, consumer protection yeah. and, and innovation advancement agency in areas beyond medical products, drugs and devices. Um, so 2024 is a very busy year ahead for FDA on the side of tobacco regulation and alternative products like like vaping products. There's been uh, talk about FDA regulating uh, menthol um, cigarettes to uh, uh, get flavors out. Um, uh, that's been controversial. FDA has been sued about how it's handling uh, vaping products. And remember the number one preventable cause of death um, is still c cigarette smoking. That's over 500 thousand deaths per year so you know some opportunities there that and also on the food safety side so a lot of things are keeping fda busy the two that i'd highlight related to drugs that don't come up so much are number one kind of following on what we just talked about around um uh more drug approvals and accelerated processes well one of the other things that fda has emphasized is that because of progress in electronic data and now AI and other tools for using well understood electronic data, um, we should be able to learn a lot more about products once they're on the market. And we haven't worked through all of those issues yet. I think they're, you know, they're so-called real world evidence, which a lot of people think of as analyses of observational data. Um, and we're getting better at that, uh, understanding data quality and at developing and applying methods that are fit for purpose for say a label expansion study or a confirmatory post-market study. But the other thing you're going to see some progress on, I think, this year is um, clinical trials that are done more in sort of real world settings. ARPA-H announced towards the end of 2023 um, a big investment in essentially trying to use digital tools to make it possible for essentially 90% plus of Americans to participate any clinical trial either where they are within a, a few miles of home with more reliance on you know digitally enabled trials that are at the point of care uh, or even at home. Um, so we haven't really seen this transformation in clinical trials yet, but we're closer than ever to facilitating it both for, I think especially for post-market label expansion studies or follow-up studies um, or drugs that have long-term effects for drugs that are approved quickly, for drugs that could be used in additional populations, think GLP-1s, um, or drugs that are coming for neurodegenerative diseases or drugs for um, you know, cancer drugs are initially approved for one indication where you really like to have a faster, easier way to do clinical trials for a much broader range of the population. Um, more represented, you know, people focus a lot on representative trials, but if the trials are small and just done in academic settings, you know, you may have more diverse people in the trial, but you don't really know if, you know, the underlying genetics or other factors about where they're getting care, is it affecting how, how, how much the, the drugs impact their outcomes? You need larger trials that can be done, you know, much more at the point of care to, to address those kinds of, you know, sort of patient specific uh, subgroup questions. So those are all coming too. And the last thing I'd mention is um, 2024 uh, next month is going to see the retirement of Janet, Janet Woodcock, who's been an institution uh, at FDA for close to 40 years, uh, serving in, as a critical um, transformer and directing the drug center, um, improving the way that FDA handled biologics, serving as uh, deputy commissioner, even acting commissioner for a while. Um, one of the things that we worked on together a lot was reforming manufacturing. Um, so there's some new steps at FDA coming there, especially around 
advanced manufacturing that, that she helped put in place and is leading with. And there's a pretty fundamental, most fundamental um, reorganization in a couple of decades of the inspectorate side of FDA, the Office of Regulatory Affairs, where it's being restructured to work much more closely with the um, experts in the drug center and the biologic centers that are overseeing other aspects of a product. So for things like CMCs, manufacturing, approvals, uh, 483s and inspections and things like that, there, there could be some, I think, potentially important and, and useful changes coming in terms of aligning um, the inspectorate with the expertise in the, uh, in the drug and biologic review divisions. Okay. Um, well, Mark, uh, I know like you as a physician, I've uh, just building on that, I've been in awe of what's going on in the science and, and the big yeah. breakthroughs in the innovation. Um, but as we always note here in this podcast, the tension of that with uh, the barriers for physicians to prescribe, you mentioned uh, intense yeah. utilization management earlier, and then also the affordability uh, for patients and, and how that creates challenges for everyone. Uh, the government's got a role as a private market regulator as well. Uh, areas in that domain, you think um, anything that may uh additionally reduce some of the burden? You talked about the expansion of the uh, Medicare uh, benefit. Are there other things that we can look forward to that may ease things a bit? Yeah, the, the, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I think people would understandably, both prescribers and patients would like to just, you know, get at when the drug is prescribed, get access to it. Um, I, I think for the reasons that we talked about, the concerns that, um, many of these drugs are going to lead to higher spending in the short term is going to create some some barriers there and i think those barriers you know may end up looking a little worse especially in standalone part d plans where these big changes are happening starting this year um, especially into 2025 and beyond since the drug plans are going to be much more accountable for those costs um, so there's more work to do there um, there have been you know ideas like um, uh, you know limiting the ability of um, drug plans to use copay accumulators. So in the um, so-called ACA exchanges, you know, there's some uh, restrictions on plans ability to do that. I would highlight that within Medicare, um, especially um, the, the, the copay accumulators are something that, um, and, and, you know, ways of like having um, uh, manufacturers forgive uh, copays is something that's uh, prohibited. So they're going to continue to be those restrictions, especially in, uh, in in Medicare, I think, which means we need to find some better approaches to recognize that higher drug spending might well, in some cases, be low value. There have been some concerns about 340B pricing, for example, encouraging a growing number of hospitals and outpatient facilities to use more expensive drugs when less expensive Part B drugs may be suitable because they get a bigger share of that markup uh, um, uh, to, to pass back to the, you know, to, to the hospital system. And a lot of hospital systems are struggling with, uh, with high costs right now, but that's not a good long-term solution for, for affordable drugs. Um, I talked about um, ways of trying to align some of the uh, efforts that drug, that, that Medicare Advantage plans are undertaking where they're accountable for things like um, uh, improving outcomes for patients with diabetes. That's a Medicare Advantage STARS measure and also accountable for total cost of care for those patients. So if we could find ways to help them use and, and evidence help them use say GLP-1 drugs more widely because there are savings effects in terms of you know, not needing as many cardiovascular drugs or not needing as many other diabetes drugs and important outcome effects and maybe savings effects too of not having cardiovascular or diabetes complications. That's what we really should be rewarding. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can do more to distinguish drug spending that's really leading to better outcomes or lower 
overall cost of care and supporting that um, rather than just trying to do you know traditional utilization review and, and other approaches across, across the board um, just because drug costs are high. And it really means more of a focus on value. And I think this is unavoidable uh, going forward. And as I mentioned at the top, um, neither party uh, seems like is, is really on the side of um, continuing high list prices for drugs uh, and um, high out-of-pocket spending as a result, but we're also seeing you know, additional concerns about deficits and uh, Congress right now is planning on reducing uh, um, total federal um, spending in, in, in many programs. So these pressures are not going away. We need better solutions. If I could, the, you, you mentioned that you know the the value of you know value based agreements or sort of the yeah. benefits of a GLP one having it having the difference it makes on other other diseases and and lowering yeah. costs in other areas. One of the one of the challenges we've heard from plans is that um, they end up paying the cost of the drug this year and they and and they never see the patient yeah. years after when they're when they no longer have diabetes or they they don't have the cardiovascular disease savings that they would have thought at the time, but they, in the meantime, they're stuck with the cost of the prescription drugs. How do we, how do we begin to look at a longer period of time for Medicare patients, or is that even possible? I, I think it is possible. You know, many Medicare patients, uh, they may not stay with their plan forever, but many of them do stay with them for multiple years. And um, we're seeing, uh, you've seen a lot of interest in, at CMS, in the Medicare program, and now also in Medicaid, and frankly, throughout the healthcare system, in trying to move to so-called value-based payment arrangements and accountable care arrangements for healthcare providers. This is actually the number one element, if you go, you know, Google it. Um, uh, Chiquita brooks Lashore, John Blom, the Deputy Administrator, um, Mina Sashamani, who heads the Center for Medicare, Dan Sai, who heads the Center for you know, Medicaid and State Programs, and Liz Fowler, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The only thing that they've all published together uh, is a series of, of papers describing how Medicare wants to move away from so-called volume-based payments, you know, fee-for-service payments to healthcare providers and to hospitals and, and um, uh, specialists and move towards more person-based payments that give healthcare providers more flexibility in how they deliver care um, because they can spend the money in different ways and put more money into more resources into preventing the downstream complications. So, you know, the providers in these accountable care arrangements get rewarded when they identify patients with, say, diabetes or diabetes risk factors, treat them early, avoid the need for more costly specialty care and, and hospitalizations. And it's true that these programs take time to get a financial payoff. But in addition to the financial payoff, these providers are also held accountable. You know, they get paid more just because you use more expensive Part B drugs or, or, or see a patient more often. You get paid more when your patients actually have better outcomes for these uh, serious conditions. Um, we're still at a point in our healthcare system where most of our spending is in the fee for service, you know, uh, part, um, but a growing amount is in value-based care. And if we can do more to integrate drugs into that, I think we can make even more progress. So if you look at some of the things that, that innovative states are doing around, um, just to give one example, I'm sorry to go into a little bit more depth, but hepatitis C. So remember we had curative drugs come out in 2014 um, that uh, essentially, you know, in an eight week course could eliminate Hep C. What was the big reaction to that? Well, it really had huge financial consequences for Medicaid plans and to some extent Medicare plans led to increases in spending in the short term. But millions of people got treatment as a result and have not gone on to develop um, cirrhosis, uh, liver cancer. Francis Collins has been kind of on a crusade since leaving NIH about, you know, why can't we make this a more general solution? Um, so we've seen some states implement so-called subscription models for paying for these drugs, you know, working in collaboration with Abbott or Gilead, you know, some of the manufacturers there on these different non-fee-for-service based contracts, kind of the same thing 
is what we're trying to do on the, the, the care, is what Medicare is trying to do, and many private payers are trying to do on the care delivery side. Let's pay for outcomes, not, not um, volume. Well, those so far haven't fully worked because we still got most payments in fee-for-service, and even in some of the states that have implemented these subscription payment models for um, drugs, think of it as a per member per month payment, which means that the net cost to a patient is close to zero or is zero, you know, once uh, they're in that plan, we still have in this country more than 2 million people with hepatitis C because it's not just about the cost of the drug, it's also about the capacity of our delivery system. Our delivery system is so used to facing, you know, barriers and, and uh, uh, utilization review and other problems for access to specialty drugs that we haven't set up those efficient care delivery systems where primary care physicians would be confident to go out and find patients who are at risk for hep C, identify them, screen them, treat them, um, you know, they, they, they don't feel confident in doing it alone. They want, you know, GI hepatology backup. Well, we, we have the technology to do that now through telehealth and things like Project Echo. That is just not the norm in care because it's not aligned with the way that we pay for both drugs and care delivery. I think we can make some real progress though in these value-based aligned arrangements between drugs and care delivery models. That's something that we're working on a lot at our program at Duke Margolis. Mm -hmm. Um, well, speaking of yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, speaking of Duke Margolis, one of the other things you've done is around public health. Um, thank you for your efforts with uh, around COVID. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit more about um, you know this the the efforts that you're leading around the twenty uh, first what's it called the twenty first century public health initiative? Twenty first century public health. Yeah, I mean, this is a reflection of um, kind of what we learned in in COVID, which was amazing biomedical innovation, but back to my point a minute ago, not necessarily the capacity to get those innovative treatments to everyone who could benefit. So we saw early on some disparities emerging, particularly for black and brown Americans, uh, more rural patients, uh, just in terms of access. They didn't have uh, as, as good of technology enabled primary care, they weren't uh, as maybe as uh, uh, aware of, of how they could get treatments and the treatments weren't as easily available. We saw some real temporary progress through things like uh, pop-up um, vaccination clinics and things like that out in more diverse communities. But that was like a sort of a, a one-time special setup. You know, we've since kind of gone back to differential access, less access in rural, uh, uh, care and this is in the context uh, overall of despite having you know, some of the best biomedical innovation in the world and certainly the most expensive healthcare in the world, population health outcomes have been over the past decade plus getting worse, not better. That trend seems to be reversing now finally uh, as we, you know, in the course of 2022, 2023, but that's after a huge impact of COVID on uh, uh, disproportionate impacts on, uh, on life expectancy. So what our 21st century public health efforts are really about doing is building on, making the, some of the things that we saw work in COVID more built into our healthcare systems capabilities. I already talked about uh, hepatitis C, which is something where, you know, right now it's viewed as, uh, you know, a public health problem for people who use intravenous drugs or, or may have other risk factors and are not connected, you know, maybe they're getting their care through a safety net, um, federally qualified health center. Well, those FQHCs typically don't feel comfortable in prescribing and overseeing the, the use of curative um, uh, hepatitis C treatments. But as I mentioned, there, there are models that can do that. If we have healthcare and public health working together and we're paying more based on the person and uh, their outcomes to enable those technology supported community based models. The same thing is possible to address other aspects of, uh, of health disparities to uh, uh, align some of the goals around public health, whether it's uh, addressing obesity, I talked about smoking earlier, where healthcare providers could do more to help if they had the right kind of support. And these are not problems you can solve by seeing a patient in office visit a couple of times per year. These are problems that you can potentially solve though with 
technology-enabled care that gets to a patient where they are, that relies on community health workers, um, uh, trusted organizations in a community. And right now at CDC, the, the CDC director came from North Carolina, uh, Mandy Cohen is a physician who has experience at CMS as well, uh, now at CDC, and is really trying to, to bring that notion of paying for health, you know, something that we did working with the state of North Carolina, North Carolina, and, and uh, COVID, uh, to uh, a national approach to better align public health goals with these population-based, you know, accountability reforms in, in, in CMS. So there really is a potential alignment between where CMS would like to go in terms of paying for better health and focusing on things like addressing the, the social drivers, uh, transportation, food, housing that, that are really getting in the way of, you know, you can't adhere to your medications if you don't have a, if you're worried about a, a safe place to, to, to live or, or adequate access to food or transportation uh, to your medical um, visits when you need them. You have to solve those problems first. And what we're doing on the, the healthcare reform side around value-based care and accountable care could match up with what CDC is now trying to do on the, the, the public health side um, to, to get to you know, a better data and better supports at the community level to address things like opioid use disorder, obesity, smoking. Um, there's so much more technology we have for bringing public health and healthcare together. Um, we're just not gonna get there if we stick with you know, the same old fee-for-service payments for drugs and the same old fee-for-service payments for healthcare. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Um, and, ju and just expanding a little bit on uh, activities at the Mark Olis Center, Mark, we're aware, obviously, that you've started a track on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, share some uh -huh. thoughts of, uh, around the outlook for that and, and the applications in healthcare. I think lots of applications in healthcare. Most of the, the early ones are going to be in sort of the, one of the number one concerns for healthcare providers today, which is burnout and administrative burden and complexity. Uh, these are also kind of safer, you know, help with uh, uh, drafting your notes for you, you know, write in conjunction with a patient visit, help with complying with those uh, uh, CMS uh, claims reporting requirements or the, uh, the prior authorization. I think we are going to have a bit of an arms race, by the way, on uh, uh, prior authorization, uh, AI enabled. Uh, CMS is taking some steps to create some digital standards there, but um, uh, you know, we, we need to solve these underlying problems of financial alignment, not just think that you know, more uh, prior authorization uh, uh, aided by AI is gonna help, um, but it can really reduce nursing uh, burdens too, it can help with patient follow-up, can help with patient scheduling, it's a lot of operational issues. Similar kind of operational benefits, I think already happening on the drug development side where we're seeing a lot more sort of fit for purpose drug design by feeding in uh, all kinds of data on you know, molecular shape, folding and, and identifying candidates for targets that people had previously thought were undruggables. Um, and then also for simulating how clinical trials and the like might work. I, I consider all those kind of like uh, operational reforms, ones that aren't directly you know, having AI substitute for delivering care, have AI substitute for a clinical trial. The next round will be more efforts to inform clinical decisions, just like they're informing um, product development decisions. So we're seeing a lot of that already with imaging uh, uh, techniques where good complete data can translate into predictable, reliable guidance. We've had a lot of stumbles though um, in earlier years when we've tried to use more complex, less well understood, maybe less re representative data more widely. You know, think about um, some of the sepsis tools that were kind of tested and validated in certain systems, tried to apply them elsewhere, and they overpredicted and mispredicted um, patients who were at risk for sepsis. Think about some of the tools that we used to identify people who were at high risk of complications, but the measures we used were related to healthcare utilization, not underlying health status, and that ended up, uh, back to my point about you know social determinants of health, people who had um, less access to healthcare, um, minority uh, American, you know, African Americans, um, 
Hispanic Americans, people who lived in more rural areas, um, actually were harmed by by some of those early um, decision analytic tools. So um, at Duke, uh, we're part of a, a collaboration for evaluating AI and also for thinking about what regulatory policies should look like in this space. Uh, um, our regulatory policies are traditionally designed for, for particular products that don't change. AI products, like other digital tools, are and should continue to evolve. So creating a, a mechanism for initial validation uh, and creating a mechanism for kind of best practices for you, are you uh, improving the product in a way that, that's not going to create biases and so forth? That's the next important um, regulatory challenge. My, my hope is that um, we're going to make a lot of progress with those operational AI applications in the short term and then can build on that with better understood data validation and, and testing in diverse settings that will help give confidence that um, uh, these more advanced AI tools that really help with diagnosis, decision making, et cetera, um, guided by clinicians, um, can, can make a big, uh, a positive difference too. Wow, that's exciting. And I know that uh, AI is a big topic at JP Morgan this year as well. So it, it sounds like it's a, it's a, uh, an exciting area and an exciting area for 2024 and beyond. Um, Mark, thank you for joining us. We, we, we're in the home stretch of our, of our interview and our, we get to one of the things that Scott and I enjoy every, every time we interview a guest is to ask them, what is, what is your prescription for better access? So Mark, what is your Are prescription you just for better access? With, uh, uh, there are a lot of things we could do, but given some of the things we've talked about today, um, and especially given your audience, uh, look, there, there's there been huge efforts in drug innovation, and and you know, I understand that these are challenging issues, and so there, there needs to be a clear path for for um, financial reward, you know, a clear net present value to investing in drugs and making them available. Traditionally, the way to get there is to set a high price and, and try to go into the teeth of utilization review, prior authorization, slow uptake and access. I think we're increasingly seeing that a different model might be possible, one where the net price for a drug is actually significantly lower, but there is an opportunity for collaboration with healthcare providers, especially those moving into value-based arrangements, and even plans and, and PBMs that are part of uh, plans that are accountable for total cost of care and increasingly accountable for outcomes to move to a different kind of pricing model. So just as we're seeing movement towards outcomes-based and, and person-based payments for healthcare providers, the, the payment for drugs that should go along with that isn't fee-for-service. It's something more like a population access where the drug manufacturers might share in some of that financial risk related to improving outcomes and uh, related to lowering downstream costs. That's going to be particularly important for some of the gene therapies and, and other long-term potentially transformational therapies that are coming along. Those are going to be tough to pay for with a, you know, $3 million up front, and we're already seeing these kinds of payment models be adapted for sickle cell treatments, you know, paying based on outcomes over time or spreading the risk on more of a PMPM basis and linking it to steps to prescribe efficiently and, and effectively through the payment reforms on the provider side. So that's what I see as a, um, really the next generation of moving beyond these prior auth and, and you know, sort of volume-based, high price, low volume fights to where, you know, think about it, you could actually get to a model where um, health plans and providers might actually go out and try to find patients uh, mm -hmm. with, with diabetes risk factors and with, with hepatitis C and, and actually fulfill the promise of these curative and, and transformative treatments. But we're not going to get there by continuing to fight for the old fee-for-service uh, payment system for drugs and everything that goes along with it. <laughs> well, well said. Uh, as uh, Mark knows, that's been a, uh, a dream of mine, uh, pricing yeah. moderation in exchange for improved access and, you know, from your lips, as they say. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for joining us, Mark. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you.
Great to be with you all and uh, look forward to a bright 2024. Some challenges ahead, but you know, the opportunities for, for drugs and biomedical innovation to make a difference in the United States and around the world have never been greater. It's a really interesting time to be talking about and working on all these issues. Great. Great. Well, we, uh, we also, if you don't mind, bear with us for one second, Mark. Uh, Scott and I do a little bit of a quick wrap up of sort of lessons learned and things that we, uh, we think uh, our audience should walk away with. So, um, Scott, you want to go first? You want me to go first? I, yeah, I'll hit a couple things. Um, obviously, the, the importance of 2024 and the political government aspects of this came through loud and clear. Also clear, I think, though, that this is whatever happens in 24. These are long term challenges. This tension is fundamental and not going away. And the, the budget pressures and all that sort of stuff is going to continue. Um, it does require, obviously, a thoughtful approach in, in that regard and just layering on more of, you know, the uh, challenges in the system today are not going to take care of it. Uh, one of the things that really came through for me in the discussion was the fundamental importance of payment reform generally mm -hmm. and specifically as it relates to drugs, that uh, uh, that, that is uh, a key to smarter, better use and a more sustainable environment for innovation over time. And then secondly, just the important role of technology in enabling this as well. It can make us more efficient in operations today and make us smarter for, you know, what we do tomorrow as well. Oh, I think those are all, all excellent points. I think uh, for me, uh, I am so excited that we started off 2024 with an optimistic view and I am walking away more hopeful uh, than I've ever been. And uh, because last year, Mark, you don't know this, but or if unless you've listened to all 13 of our podcasts, but there was there we were we were interviewing different stakeholders and different aspects of it. And it was always a sort of what what Jamie Robinson, health economist out of Berkeley, called the war of all against all. Right. And so um, but what you've described today is some specific steps that are taken uh, that could have a, a, a significant impact. And, you know, I'll just use the example of hep C, which is there is a cure. There is a treatment. And so. You know, think about the patients. So many patient communities out there are waiting for a cure. Um, and here we have hep C and we can't seem to get the other side of it, which is care delivery figured out. And so uh, and of course, as you said, payment reform, right? Like moving in a direction where we're all incented to save those two million lives. I mean, just think about it. You know, if we all sort of rallied together and say, let's save two million lives today, uh, we should be able to figure this out. So that it is more hopeful, it is more optimistic, I think for me, um, that there are things that we could do. From a patient perspective, uh, where I got my start was, um, I would say that there are gonna continue to be some burden, or some barriers, uh, but the, even there, there's some hopeful signs. The IRA, uh, the, the improvements in Medicare Part D, um, we gotta watch out for the barriers that might exist in future plans. Um, but overall, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, thinking 2024 is one of solutions and innovation and ideas. I think Mark's outlined some as a great way to kick off 2024. Yep. So thank you. So with Thanks that, again. Mark, great thank you. you thank you for joining us. And uh, and let me just finish the uh, podcast by saying that uh, uh, some of the things that Mark mentioned, uh, we will create links um, and uh, put them into the episode descriptions uh, and the show notes. And uh, uh, thank you. I want to thank Mark again for joining us. Thank my co-host, Dr. Scott Howe. And uh, thanks, thanks to the listeners for, uh, for joining us on another episode of Prescription for Better Access.